All right, this one is the trauma. So this patient, you can see the initial study is on the left and I made it bounce, but you can see there's a little left lower quadrant fluid and then retroperitoneal fluid coming up the left flank. And that's, that's it. It's just that thin line of fluid. You can see again in the left lower quadrant right there, it's probably a tear of an IMA branch. And this patient probably has a high peritoneal reflection that put the sigmoid colon in effectively an extra peritoneal or retroperitoneal position. So the patient came back, I think this was about 10 days later, and had a perforated colon, all kinds of retroperitoneal gas, as well as adjacent gas, wall thickening, clearly an ischemic bowel, and uh, incredibly died from this. So there is the relevant part of the read, which is basically no free fluid or air, no acute abdominal or pelvic injury. Pretty tough call. Got a 10 out of 10. Uh, all right, here we go. This patient presented, he was a pizza delivery guy who had driven his car into a tree. The CT was interpreted as normal. The patient was discharged, but returned one week later with abdominal pain and fever, quickly became septic and died. Autopsy revealed necrotic sigmoid colon. So they thought it would be $3 million, 60% success rate, a portion liability of 25%, and the estimated settlement came out to 650, and we paid 725. Uh, mitigating factors where this was a pizza parlor employee with little lost earnings. There were no dependents or family, so there was no loss of consortium. Both the surgeon and emergency physician were argumentative and defensive with counsel and each other. So that's uh, never a good sign. Okay, this is one of our thromboembolic cases. So as you can see, again, this patient was uh, reported as having mildly dilated, thickened loops of small bowel in the pelvis, likely represents enteritis uh, with associated ileus. Follow-up radiographs are recommended to exclude obstruction. And there are indeterminate splenic hypodensities. You heard me say it yesterday, don't do that. If you've got a peripheral subcapsular triangular wedge-shaped hypodensity, don't call it an indeterminate. Uh, say, think about it at least and think, could this possibly be a microembolic phenomenon? In addition, it's easy to see thickened bowel loops and just go to enteritis. I did it when I reviewed this case. They said, hey, will you take a look at this case? And I looked at it and I said, well, there's probably enteritis, right? But then I saw that splenic issue and thought, wait a minute, maybe an SMA occlusion brings all this together. And so when you go up and you look at the SMA, it very clearly is completely blocked. So there are the little splenic hypodensities and now follow the SMA, gone. Right, so look at that SMA every time and certainly look at it every time when you're looking at bowel pathology because all that is wall thickening is not necessarily enteritis. This one got dinged for hedging because again, you know, you see these bowel cases and people are just kind of wandering around being very nonspecific, descriptive, but not diagnostic. So this patient came in at 9 p.m., presented with abdominal pain, CT was read as thick wild bowel. Their final read was not materially different. Ultimately was admitted at midnight, but developed hypotension and acidosis. Majority enterectomy was performed. Estimated verdict was 2.25. Chance of success 40, a portion liability 60, and a estimated settlement of 650. And so pretty close to that, we paid an indemnity of 700. 25,000. The on-site radiologist did not report any clots in the SMA, the SMV, or their branches in her initial interpretation. However, after being contacted by the general surgeon, she re-reviewed the images and found clots in the branches of the SMA and SMV. Well, the SMV is actually not clotted. Uh, it is her opinion that not enough clinical information was given to find the clots on her initial interpretation. I don't think that's ever going to hold up. 
In fact, it was really rare that uh, anyone citing a lack of clinical history that that seemed to move the needle at all. It really didn't. And if you are looking at the SMA in, as part of your search pattern on every abdomen, pelvis, CT you read, you're not gonna have that problem. All right, another one, a uh, very similar case. This patient actually has renal hypodensities instead of splenic ones, but it's otherwise almost identical. There are the wedge-shaped peripheral subcapsular hypodensities, uh, this time in the kidneys, and an occluded SMA right there. So this patient actually had a, uh, a bariatric surgery as well, although it didn't factor into this one. So look at this report. I had to make it scroll like credits. Wow, again, you find yourself issuing something like this. Oh wait, here's the succinct impression, no. Okay, I'm not kidding. It ends with et cetera. Do you see that? The last, it ends with et cetera. So that was not enough. He had to say et cetera. Okay, so uh, we're gonna take a few rules from this, but don't end your reports with et cetera, especially if they're 10 pages long. So this one, the ridiculous thing is this was a prelim, right? So a final was later issued. Uh, so we only get, this was the lowest scoring report in the entire collection at five out of 10, clearly dinged for hedging and disclaimers, most notably. So a final was issued. Ah, my. As far as I'm concerned, these two can share a jail cell. It, this one goes on and on as well, but does, oh, get so, just a little closer a couple of small wedge-shaped areas of diminished perfusion of the left kidney are seen. The appearance is nonspecific, but suggestive of small infarcts. He was this close, but it didn't inspire him to, uh, to look at other vascular structures to potentially uh, discern the source. So that's a disappointing one. All right, so this patient, came in with an, uh, an operative hernia repair, presented with post-operative abdominal pain. The CT was read as subcugas and ileus enteritis, as so many are, SBO not excluded. The final read did note the renal abnormalities, but not the SMA. The patient was admitted and treated for a post-op MI. Two additional CTs with no diagnosis of SMA thrombosis were done. Emergent laparotomy for free gas revealed ischemic bowel and the patient was made DNR. So estimated verdict was 1.5 million, 51% chance of success, 25% apportioned liability, and a 625 global of which we ended up paying 200,000. You've probably noted that the indemnities are going down because I have these a lot of them uh, arranged by age. So the ages are going up. And it's incredible to me that you're just not worth much once you hit retirement age, right? The economists come in and they do your evaluation of your earnings potential, and that's what it's all based on. So kind of sad, but uh, take care of yourself if you're retired, because no one else will. Uh, decidedly rural area verdict pools from rural aspects of Illinois tend to be conservative and more defense friendly. Interesting. Uh, the, Decedent worked at Sunset Lakes Resort. She was paid in cash and credit towards discounted camping costs. Interesting, but not a lot of earning potential. Uh, and she was working for Mary Kay, which everybody knows is a pyramid scheme. <laughs> uh, her medical records reflect that five seemingly reasonably well-qualified radiologists, seemingly reasonably well-qualified radiologists, reviewed multiple abdomen pelvic CT studies, and none of them specifically identified the presence of a thrombus. Uh, at this time, the only negative aspect is the plaintiff's expert apparently did identify the SMA on the uh, abpel CT scan. It's certainly not hard to do. 
All right, folks. So that is the entire run of the big ones, the epidural abscesses, the aortic dissections, and the ischemic bowels. So we'll take a quick break and then we'll review everything else. Well, we're gonna take those out. Oops, sorry. Uh, we're gonna take those out and then reorder things so we go kind of anatomically from here on out. But we've got a few still to review. I doubt we'll get to all the carcinomas. The one thing that's interesting about the carcinomas was there was no theme whatsoever. Every one of the carcinoma cases that we have that we missed is a different tumor type in a different organ, and there's really nothing but adhere to your search pattern to uh, take away from it. Right? And the other ones do have some useful stuff, though, so we'll uh, we'll come back in a in 15 and and do the rest. So. For the oral contrast, oh, repeat this one. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, so that's a great question. IV contrast, it's easy to, to realize why in a post-bariatric surgery patient you would want to have IV contrast, right? Because it allows you to assess those vessels. Oral contrast would probably not have helped with these specific cases. However, there are a number of complications for bariatric surgery that are helped with oral contrast. So if you have staple line dehiscence or any kind of perforation or any associated bowel obstruction, oral contrast will help enormously. And so even though none of those was at issue with these cases, they are common complications of bariatric. Uh, I have a collection of bariatric complications in, uh, on our uh, vrad.com CME, and uh, there is a whole collection of those there that show that oral contrast is helpful. So, yes, very good question. The second part of the question mm -hmm. is, uh, there's not a specific correlation between bariatric surgery and uh, medical care for bowel obstruction. Is there something that you can do? These complications are very common. The uh, surgery actually uh, disrupts the normal peritoneal reflections and planes and allows greater mobility of the bowel. And so it's more easily uh, volvulous and obstructed that way. Uh, and you develop a specific type of internal hernia called a Peterson hernia that, that puts you at risk for all these things. In fact, that was, I thought it was funny uh, that one of the legal comments on one of those bariatric surgery cases said, this radiologist didn't even know it was called a Peterson hernia. And I remember I was reading it and I said, what's a Peterson hernia? <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't think that was a very fair point. So. <laughs>